Thank you for everyone uh, to join the launch of uh, Jake's Cohen, uh, Cohen's Carols recording for ICSM Records. Um, I am extremely pleased uh, with the work we've done. Uh, I've known uh, Jake for uh, I think 12 years, if I'm not mistaken. The, the, the first time I think we played in Sofia with the Sofia soloists uh, we did Schnitke Piano Concerto and some uh, other works, uh, contemporary music mainly, uh, published by Schott. I remember the, 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 the thread was uh, Schott's published works. And um, since then we've, uh, we've seen each other, we've worked again in Cadogan Hall once. So um, I've known him for some time, uh, mainly uh, as a conductor and uh, uh, less as a composer, uh, even if I, I knew his arrangement uh, of uh, Mussorgsky, the pictures at an exhibition. Uh, and uh, I'm really, really happy to have him on board uh, for our small label. Uh, we, that, this is our uh, 17th release. We've been around for slightly more than five years. Um, we are, musicians ourselves and uh, myself and my wife, um, pianists uh, performing and also recording and also uh, releasing recordings of other artists, not just ourselves. Um, we believe that this kind of music is um, not only beautiful, but also very meaningful in terms of content. The way has been also recorded. I'm really pleased and impressed with the with the job done by the sound engineer and the choice of the location and uh, also of course the very tasteful design of the of the product itself. I think it's uh, uh, we always aim to to create something which is not just good recording but also that looks nice. Uh, we the choice of a, of a digi pack, regardless of the fact that people are not uh, so much into purchasing uh, uh, CDs, uh, is because we believe that a recording is uh, it, it has to be a, an all round quality product. So it is very important for us uh, to release something that uh, it's very balanced. It has the balance of uh, content and presentation. This is extremely important. So um, I would be very happy to pass now the microphone to Jake to present the recording and tell, uh, tell us something about uh, the idea behind 
this project, how it was born and and of course as well the re realization. Here we, we uh, just one more thing we have here uh, also a couple of uh, uh, singers from the choir and I'm very happy about that because they've done as well a great job and also the uh, designer, the designer of, uh, of uh, all our production, Ivo, who is based uh, in Bulgaria, my country, country of origin. He's um, a music lover and a person who has a very uh, pronounced aesthetic sense um, about uh, his work. So um, welcome to everyone, all friends and, uh, and people who love music in general. So, Jake, it's your turn. Okay. Okay. Um, so um, this is um, a compilation of um, pieces which I've written over a number of years, probably over about um, twenty years. And um, I always had this idea. I mean, when one writes for a choir, most of these pieces no. were written for. Um, uh, Lloyd's Choir, which is a very fine amateur oh, choir that Mike mm -hmm. comes up, and um, um, we've we've worked together. Anyone who works with, I mean, of course, in this country, is we have this great amateur tradition, and actually a, a remarkably high standard of amateur music making. But nowhere is that more apparent than with choirs. It's quite extraordinary um, how good some of our choirs are, and of course, it works at all levels. But um, many people in other countries are quite surprised by how, how, how often we use amateur choirs. For example, all the major choruses in London are amateur choirs. It's only really the BBC singers and the opera choruses and so on, which are, which are professional. So it meant that um, I was able to write quite challenging music for this choir. And um, I had this idea of when you write for a choir, it's mostly Christmas is such an important part of the of the performing calendar. Um, so I ended up writing lots of pieces, short pieces for our unaccompanied Christmas concerts. And as I got about halfway into these, um, as I'd written about, about half a dozen of these, I, it, it sort of the idea went around my head that I really ought to, at some point to do a disc of these. And um, it happened a few years ago, they ended up being published in, by North Music Verlag published it in a series. And I always had this idea that um, I'd call them Cohen's Carols because, not just because it's alliterative, I mean, obviously an alliterative title is something that we, we often like to, to use, but also because I thought there was something quite funny about carols, which we associate so much with Christmas, uh, Christian festival being preceded by um, such an overtly Jewish name, but, but everyone seemed <laughs> to like it. And that's, that's the compilation that we originally published. Um, but two of the pieces on the disc are not Christmassy pieces, they're for remembrance. I mean, there are one or two pieces which are wintry, a few, you know, which are wintry rather than anything religious or necessarily Christmas. So it is quite a, a mixture. But um, I also um, wrote a few years ago um, two remembrance anthems, which are also published in a separate um, edition. And of course, all the carols are, are as well as you can buy the anthology, you can buy them all separately. But um, I thought I really ought to do a proper recording of this and with a professional choir. And um, my very first choice of choir was Oxford Camerata. I've been a big fan and um, Jeremy Summerley, um, the music director of Oxford Camerata has just <laughs> magically appeared as if, as if my name conjured him up by magic. And um, but I've been a huge admirer. This choir has done, well, Jeremy will correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's about 40 discs over the years. Um, fantastic discs. I mean, mostly, mostly on the Naxos label, but, but other labels as well, I think. Um, if you haven't heard their foray Requiem or their recordings of Palestrina and Hildegard, etc., terrific recordings. So um, I did know Jeremy um, years ago. We'd met um, at a concert, actually, where we did an orchestral piece of mine called Quiet Music, and um, we were introduced, and Jeremy's initial comment, you probably won't remember, he said, I've got one criticism of your piece, it was the loudest piece on the program, which, which was true, but um, we, um, so I, 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 you know, made the sentence that we met and talked about this disc, 
And as usual, Jeremy got a fantastic group together. There was some discussion, because of course, Jeremy normally is the conductor of this group, but there was some discussion over who would produce, we thought, you know, one of us would produce and one of us would, um, would conduct. Um, and I said, he said that he didn't mind. I said, I'd much rather conduct because I find um, producing rather stressful. Um, we see that Suzanne Stanslight and Andrew Fuller are here. Suzanne Stanslight is one of the very key players in the um, label Meridian. Um, and, and they um, and, and working together. She's the chief producer for Meridian. Um, and, um, and she will know, because she asked me to produce a few discs for them. Um, that producing I find stressful. I think it, you have to be very organized to be a good producer, um, which, which I am when I'm conducting, but producing is difficult because um, you have to write very neatly on the score. And I've got terrible writing. In fact, it's got worse. And I even struggle to um, decipher my own writing somehow, which is, which is the last thing you want for a producer. So um, we decided that I would conduct and Jeremy would produce. And he put, for, put together a fantastic group. Um, now, who else is here? So Jake Muffet is here. And we've also got Helen Hewson. Hello, Helen. Um, lovely to see you. And who else have I mentioned? Caroline Halls. Hi. Yes. Fantastic soprano, and um, if there's anyone I've missed out, missed out, um, do do yell. Anyone, any one of the singers who have missed out, uh, do yell. So, um, um, and um, so it was, it was, it was really good to do this. And um, Jeremy also um, recommended a really good engineer, Dave Dave Hinnett, who I'd not worked with before, who, as Evo said, um, has done a fantastic job with the sound. Um, so it was a real joy to do it and to work with such a fantastic choir um, was, was wonderful. And um, it obviously it take, so it took a while to work out which pieces we were going to put on the disc because I've easily got enough material of choral music to do two discs, which we might do. We might get around to that eventually, Cohen's Carols 2 um, in, in years to come, but um, that's, that's a long way off now. Um, what I haven't mentioned before actually to anyone is that I was so impressed by the choir because, um, as I say, most of these were performed with a, with, with a very good amateur choir and they did very well. But of course, as anyone will tell you, it's a totally different, different thing working with, um, a really, with a professional choir. And I remember the first piece that we rehearsed was The Lamb. And um, that sounded, you know, it sounded, but no, with no disrespect to, to Lloyd's Choir, it sounded um, better at the initial run through than, than, than the Lloyd's Choir did in the performance. Um, and it's a great compliment. Actually, it's the best compliment I think a composer can have is when you hear your music played well, because it means it works. It must have something <laughs> because, because, well, I mean, because um, I suppose a really good group can make anything sound good, but, um, but they really made the pieces, helped, helped um, to strengthen my faith in the pieces and make them sound really good. But the thing that I was going to say, which I hadn't mentioned before, is inspired by um, their performance, is I was very interested to think about what might be possible. And I have um, since been working on a piece, um, which I hope to finish at some point. Um, I've been sort of a bit sidetracked at the last few months with various other big projects. But there is um, a piece I've been working on for them, which I hope to send to Jeremy when he's ready, which is, 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 very, is very challenging, but hopefully um, some very interesting chords and sounds, which um, if the choir sings them, will, 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 work, will, will work very well. So that's sort of an overview of the disc. If, um, uh, um, if you want to say something now, Evo, um, or if you have any questions, you can ask or in the chat or or live or whatever, but then I could talk about the individual pieces if you like after that. But um, perhaps, perhaps Eva, would you like to say, would anyone else, or Eva, perhaps you'd like to say something or anyone else at this point? Well, of course, um, I have a few questions. Um, one is uh, definitely uh, the, the reasons behind the choice of the works, their combination and also the order on the recording because obviously um, uh, when uh, we decided to to publish uh, the, the the recording uh, it was entirely 
your artistic direction in terms of how to order the, the works? Is, is there a specific reason to have that specific order uh, with, the, with the works? And um, why exactly those? Because from what I understand, there could have been some other pieces as well uh, be done. So um, the reason behind the aesthetic choice of the, of the works that's that's a really good question because um there were lots of other pieces and it was took a long time to get the short list down to the 11 that that you see on the disc and obviously um it has to be a right number of pieces that we can record in the time available um so it's really a question of what fits together that there isn't anything that sticks out i mean there was another very good well a piece that i think is relatively good in my that I'm quite pleased with called Hymnus Universalis which I thought which almost made the final cut and the reason it didn't is because it somehow um it didn't quite connect with the others in terms of the words um because actually there aren't any words in that piece it's all because it's all the universal language which um universal language of, of music but and there's a very interesting story behind that piece but it's so sort of wacky, it would sort of, it would either wouldn't fit with the disc or it would detract attention away from it. But also it's been rearranged as part of a much bigger orchestral piece. So for that reason, that wasn't included. And it was getting the right combination, getting the order right um, was, um, was really difficult because you have to have several goes at it. So, um, it made sense to have the two um, pieces in Latin, the two original compositions in Latin, Vidit Lucem Manium and No Magnusterium, next to each other. Um, it made sense to have Gaudete, which is in Latin, but it is an arrangement at the start of the piece. It made sense generally to have the three arrangements, um, which aren't original compositions, um, the um, Gaudete, I saw three ships and I wonder and I wonder, not all next to each other, because they're the ones which for, um, for I don't know, I hate to use the word connoisseur, but for the people who aren't connoisseurs, they like to have an arrangement, you know, that something, oh, I know that tune, um, or maybe even for the younger listeners. And then it made sense to have the two settings of Blake next to each other. Um, so once you've sorted that out, then it sort of fits it's a question of fitting it together. One thing, right, it seems so obvious that the two remembrance anthems, which are kind of, they're not wintry, they're not Christmassy, they're right at the end of the disc, which seems obvious, but actually that was a very late decision. Originally we were going to end the disc on I Wonder I, As I Wonder, but it was because changing, changing the order of those two, because oh, okay. I thought we couldn't end with Anthem for Doomed Youth because that's so grim and Flanders Fields is much more meditative. Um, so anyone, I think anyone will tell you when they put a CD together, when it's not, I mean, unless you're recording a symphony on, a, on an overture or something like that, it, it, it takes a long time to put them all together. And actually, um, we actually have a friend who, because um, my wife is here, or she was here a minute ago, um, Michelle, who um, did another recording herself of her arrangements and um, of, um, oh, there she is, and um, they did several arrangements about, same number, about 12 on the disc, and it took a long, with Estilo Quartet, who she arranges for, took a long time to get the order right. They have a, a violist there who's brilliant, at, has a knack for getting the order right, of anything we always are you know we ask her we didn't ask her for this because she hadn't been involved and she didn't know the tracks but um yeah that was kind of the that's sort of one of the last steps it's really because now i think the order is just right and hopefully it seems like it was always meant to be that way um but um it took a long time to get that way but actually it's a bit like anything when you write a piece of music um if you write it once you, the piece is finished, you know it's finished because it always seems inevitable. With all the great pieces of music, with all, um, I mean, I'm not making any comparison, but we take, you know, one of the very great composers, you know, in a different league, obviously, for well, from almost anyone. Um, but um, um, you took a Beethoven, his, his music always sounds so inevitable. 
as though it was always destined to be that way. And you have no idea, we, you know, we're not aware of all the, the, the hours and hours and days and days of sketches that he had to do, go through to get to that, to get to that point. I mean, the other thing I didn't mention is that, of course, once we've decided on um, the venue, you know, All Hallows Gospel, um, Gospel, Gospel Oak, which was a fantastic acoustic, which Jeremy had already recorded in, but um, getting the right label on board. And I'm so pleased to be included in the ICSM series because this is this is a really great label. I mean, even though they've been only not going that long, they're already very well established. They've had fantastic reviews. As Evo said, the product looks great. The whole product, the whole aesthetic, the whole ethos and philosophy of what a CD is now. Um, and in thinking of a CD as a sort of artwork in itself, so that it's not just something that you down, you just listen to the odd track of on Spotify, but also they've had great artists and also working with Evo, um, having worked with him as a musician, and also the fact that um, it is a, a label run by musicians for musicians, um, which just feel, felt, felt, felt really right. I mean, of course, the other thing about Evo is, as well as being an amazing pianist, he, um, he's, uh, I hope you don't mind me mentioning the vineyard, but... Um, okay. you can. Well, well, I tell you why. I have an ulterior, ulterior motive, because um, we had originally discussed, before all the lockdown, obviously, that we were going to do, um, or before, you know, the COVID crisis, we were hoping to do a launch in the city um, with uh, maybe some of Evo's wonderful wines. Yes. Which, well, which are named after pieces of music on the CDs that he produces, of course, as well. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yes, of course, but now the situation is as, as it is. So, obviously, we have to do virtual uh, presentations of uh, recordings. Uh, and virtual wine. <laughs> well... <Virtual. laughs> yes. Uh, but of course, Ivo Christoph, uh, who is here, he, who is the designer, um, he has a very interesting approach. Uh, he he's a, a very serious uh, music collector himself. Uh, he listens to a lot of uh, different genre. Um, he's got a fantastic system at home with uh, valve amplifiers, with uh, speakers that you have to ask permission to your wife to have at home generally. Uh, huge uh, speakers and, uh, and um, he generally listens to the music before uh, looking for, for the approach with the design. So that is a very important element for me uh, because uh, obviously, um, and the colors, uh, I think the cover is just one element, but the colors of inside, they, they try to express the ideas, um, the ideas behind the music. So um, this is a very important element. And I think a lot of designers, um, we are very fortunate because a lot of designers don't listen to music actually. And they work in a way that uh, it's completely abstract from the musical content of the recording. So I think this is a very important um, element, uh, which, and we always have a phrase uh, which uh, we ask the artist to choose. And in this particular case, Jake, would you like to read it? Uh, what, what you've chosen as a phrase? So it's a quote from Thomas Wentworth Higginson and it says, how many lessons of faith and beauty we should lose if there were no winter in our year? How many lessons of faith and beauty we should lose if there were no winter in our year? And um, I think that's, that's sort of self-explanatory, but it seems particularly um, relevant at this time because we're not just in the winter of our year, we're going through very difficult times. And the idea is, I mean, winter is every culture um, that we know of, that I can think of in, in the world, always has a winter, some kind of winter solstice festival to counteract the darkness and the cold. And, and obviously that's no coincidence, but um, so it's always, we always need joyous music at this time, but we also, um, we appreciate it's necessary so that we appreciate all the times when it's sunny and warm and lovely and all the good times that happen. 
Um, and so actually I thought the, the um, overall message of the disc is, is, is one of hope. The feeling of the music is very positive, that it's, there are lots of very positive pieces, um, but there are some very dark pieces, but it is in the context of, pos of, of positivity. Yes, uh, I, I perfectly agree with you. Uh, and of course, I would be very happy to involve the singers. Uh, uh, if uh, Caroline, Jake, uh, and also who else is at the moment with us, and Helen, if they would like to say a few things, that would be great, if possible. If they would like to unmute themselves. I think the um, <clears throat> the thing about it is that it was quite a long time ago, um, uh, and um, I mean all, all these things fade into one for me anyway. Because I mean it's a little bit like Jake's has said is that um, it because it's such an easy group of singers to work with. So I mean you're you're all I, for me. I mean. Uh, first as a conductor, but but more as a producer. I think that's what Jake's is getting at. I um, I produce about three or four uh, records a year, which is quite enough. Um, I enjoy producing, but it is quite a stressful thing, and um, I find that it's a, it's it's quite an unsatisfactory experience in terms of the music because you're not about the music; you're about everything else, about sort of filtering out the extraneous sounds, making sure that there's a balance there, making sure that you can edit from that take that you did yesterday to the one you're just working on at the moment. It's actually quite an unmusical um, experience. I do enjoy the process, but it's not for me primarily a musical one. So I come away from sessions that I've produced, not really with an impression of the music, but more with a massive sense of relief that I think that in spite of that cement mixer going off here and the fact that we don't know how to suppress the church bells and that, you know, Jake has got a sore throat so he doesn't want to sing a top D today or, you know, Helen might not have a bottom range, you know, or whatever it is, you know, there's always something. Um, and so I leave sessions producing with no clear idea of what I've just done, apart from a massive sense of relief that Dave Heinitt or whoever it is that's going to be doing the editing uh, will ultimately send me something that fits together. So um, I, I, as I say, I have a, a slightly out of body experience um, of it. When I'm conducting, it's entirely different because then you are totally immersed in the music and that's your only job, which is why you hire goons like me to produce because you take all that stuff out of the picture. And um, that's what I see that I'm there for is to make sure that Jake's has everything he needs to indulge himself artistically with his own music and with people that want to make it sound as good as possible and to sort of fulfill his dream as it were so that's my sort of impression I, I don't know how the singers sort of um, uh, feel about it but as I say it's just for, for me it was just a, um, a, it's a lovely place to work for church um, it's got a, it's got a generous acoustics but uh, the thing about All Hallows Gospel Oak is that it's it, it's nicely supportive of singers, but it doesn't actually obscure the uh, obscure the sound in any way. It's not a bathroom um, because there are some uh, venues that are lovely to sing in, but the acoustics are just too big. Uh, and actually, while you think, "Oh, this is lovely to sing in," when you listen back to it, you think, "But it gets tiring after a few minutes because you know if you have something that is in a very dreamy acoustic it's not easy to listen to and I think All Hallows is pretty much perfect in terms of um, the amount of singers that we had uh, the acoustics be able to hear the words which I hope I hope you can do um, uh, that, 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 that it doesn't throw up any difficult program um, problems in terms of uh, in terms of the um, balance between the voices it's very supportive but as with any venue uh, in central London um, you've always got the problem of noise. Uh, if they just, if the wind changes, and this does happen, the wind changes, all of a sudden the flight path from Heathrow goes over the church. There's not a lot you can do about that, apart from, which we do, is to make sure that every take you do is just you know, good enough to be able to use. 
uh, because you know that three out of at the wrong time of day, three out of four are going to go down the tubes because of a plane going overhead and you can't allow for that uh, it's also on um, as as you might expect uh, as all churches are it's on the corner of a road and um, uh, as you know within the calling, recording process if you've got a, a constant noise you don't want one but if you do happen to have a constant noise you can filter it out to a certain extent but a church being on a corner, which most churches are, is a nuisance because when traffic comes around, it changes gear. And when something changes gear, it changes pitch. And when it changes pitch, you can't filter it out. So as I say, if you've got a noisy boiler or um, you know, an ir irritating mains hum from some piece of electrics, it's not ideal, but you can deal with it. But what you can't do, so, and you know, and we had moments like that when, um, you know just that motorbike decided to make that noise at that point and then the lorry reversed and these days because as we know because of health and safety lorries have to make noise when they uh when they you know -da 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 -da, all that kind of stuff they have to make a noise when they reverse and um and that is all obviously going to happen at the quietest most sensitive moment of one of jake's carols so we would have had all those moments so i would have i would have left uh, as i normally do from recording thing well uh you know that was that was final do me for another few months you know i've produced that so that's that's my very negative rather techy um view of how it was we we, we got away with it we had enough i was confident we had enough material to make a lovely disc so i actually probably more than anybody am really looking forward to hearing it because i sort of wasn't listening in that way when we made it i really and which i i mean i know jakes will understand completely but if i had had a more lasting impression of the music i wouldn't have been doing my job to the thing i i have that that's my very pathetic <laughs> justification but it is it's a different job different type of ears of course it is uh very different i'm uh, i'm aware of that because I've, ban I've been in that position uh myself uh, also with some piano music recorded by friends etc where i acted as a producer and uh, also done some producing when a friend of, uh, of mine recorded the Majewski piano concerto with the Royal Scottish National and because he's Polish he needed someone local so I flew from London to Glasgow to help him out on the day uh, so I know exactly how, how you feel and um, it does take a lot of uh, courage as well and because it's a huge responsibility to produce somebody else so but from what I've heard uh, it's a great job a team effort which is uh, I think it's really impressive and I'm very happy and thank you on behalf of our small label or on the work you've done it's it's our pleasure and also a big shout out for Dave Heinet the engineer who is Yes. astonishing i mean um it's it, he is just i mean i've worked with him a lot uh, as as jake's knows i mean i had no hesitation in recommending him first um it's a rare combination he himself is also a musician he's a performer himself he sings plays the organ so he really knows it from the inside but he is so totally unflappable which is exactly what you need not all engineers are like that but um he he is able to sit there and know exactly, he, he just has this sense of knowing what will work. So you don't, I mean, I don't know if you can remember Jake's, but there was, there was very little balancing done. Very yeah. little balancing done. You know, he, he, he knows the venue, admittedly, he's done it before, but he kind of had plan A, B, C, and D all ready for us when we turned up. So, you know, and, and it's, he's just beautiful to work next to because it's so, he's so unflappable. Um, but also because he's a musician, he actually likes the product. He's a, he is actually, in a way that I'm not, able to sit there and enjoy the music. Because basically, uh, once he's set up the microphones, and he just has to make sure it's all sort of tickety boo it's all recording everything. But the rest of the time, he can actually sit back and enjoy the, um, enjoy the harmonies and the tunes uh, in a way that I can't. But anyway, so big shout out for Dave Heinet, who, without whom, um, you know, it, it, there are, of course, other good engineers out there but he is i think for choral music he is absolutely it uh, an astonishingly um impressive uh, engineer yeah. I, I would definitely endorse that i mean 
I've, and, that, and also that's in the context when I say that Dave's a, a terrific engineer, that's in the context of actually being very lucky enough to have set the bar very high, having worked with some very fine engineers. Um, of course, Patrick is here, he's a terrific engineer. And of course, um, um, Suzanne would never forgive me, and Andrew would never forgive me if I didn't mention the um, um, Richard, who um, is the um, engineer for Meridian. And already in that context, these are really terrific engineers. I mean, some of the, 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 the best that I've worked with and, and probably and highly regarded as among the best in the, in the business. Um, and, and Dave is, is, is fantastic. So in that context, you know, it's not just, um, you know, when, when we say that Dave's a terrific engineer, he gets a wonderful, wonderful um, sound. Um, that's terrific. Um, you know, it's absolutely true. I mean, what um, Jeremy said about producing, I can definitely relate to, both from having done some producing, but also from having worked with several producers. And I'll be very interested, Jeremy, in that context to hear what you make of the actual disc and what you actually think when you actually just listen to the disc for the first time as a listener, um, not just as looking for, because not just looking for what's wrong, what we need to do. Um, and one thing you realize as a conductor when I first started recording is, is the, the conductor has their name all over the disc and you have to look inside, so, you know, usually you look at all your favorite discs of all those classic recordings that you have on your shelves. You have to look somewhere inside the booklet to find the name of the producer. And so often it's the producer. Well, in a recording, the producer, can have a good producer is at least it, it's more as important, if not more important, than having a conductor who knows what they're doing. I mean, I know the pieces, so I know how they go, but but really, you know, with a group of singers we already established, you know, they're already fantastic. It's really the producer who, who organizes the session. And when you conduct a concert, you're in charge of organizing everything, you know, um, organizing the rehearsal, judging how much time you have. When you get to do a recording, it's stressful from the conductor's point of view, it's much easier because the producer has taken that all out of your hands. When I first started um, 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 recording, um, there was always a thing that puzzled me, was how I have some wonderful recordings, CDs on my shelves, with the conductors, one or two of whom I know aren't that great. It's when I started recording, I thought, ah, now I see. <laughs> it's all about the producer. Now, I think, um, Evo, I think that, um, one of our singers, I think that Caroline. Yes. Would, that was wonderful to hear from you. Yes. Hello, everybody. Um, I was just, um, uh, yes, I was just going to talk a bit if you wanted to hear about the kind of um, singer experience of the recording, like, you know, a couple of things Jeremy said. Um, made me remember, as we said, it was quite a long time ago. So forgive our initial silence while I think we gathered our thoughts um but so a lot of things Jeremy said uh are very true he is very wise um like the fact that recording a cd like for recording in any context is um in many ways uh one of the least kind of musical things that you do because everything has to be stopped and chopped up but what's important there is that the music itself what helps is when the music itself uh, is very easy to get back into, which I remember Jake's as being. Um, and as Jeremy said as well, there are lots of interesting problems with kind of the venue, the noise. I remember it being very cold. I am a generally cold person. And um, we were recording in February. So you're dressed up in, instead of being, you know, in smart black, like you would be for a concert, for example, you're in kind of jumpers. I think Eloise had slippers, um, scarves, hand warmers, you know, anything because you're just standing in a cold church for uh, however long, you know, how many hours in a day, couple of days. Um, and then coupled with that is the interesting uh, aspect of recording Christmas music in it was February, right? Because that was why it was so cold. Um, so you've got through what is traditionally the you know, busiest period of the year for singers like us, you're doing, you know, <laughs> which is obviously now making me sad because this year is very different. But normally you have, you know, carol services and concerts coming out your ears, like corporate events, messiahs, you know, 
ten of a dozen. Um, and so you've done all of that and you think Christmas is over, but wait, you're recording a Christmas disc in February. And as you say, it's not completely all Christmas, but it's all, it's all winter, definitely. Um, but yes, but I remember it being um, very enjoyable. It was nice doing, um, there were a few, there, you know, there are a bunch of carols where you, they're tunes that you know, like I saw Three Ships, I remember, so Helen has a solo on that one. I remember the one that I had a solo on, which is the Wonder As I Wander uh there were and there was a very big ambitious 12 days of christmas if i remember correctly um which i look forward to listening to i've not listened to any of them yet but um so it's very interesting you kind of have to kind of reverse the mindset that you've got you've done all of the christmas things and kind of get back into it and get back into the festive spirit um which hopefully <laughs> um we managed to do on this disc for you jakes so that's just a bit about what it was like for us. I mean, any any other singers, feel free to pop in and say what what they think. Yeah, I could definitely add something to that. Uh, can everyone hear me? Am I audible? Yeah. Great, 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 great. Um, yeah, for me, I think unusually, as far as recording a CD goes, this is actually quite a pleasant experience. Um, <laughs> it's the, the the music was uh, Jake's music was very idiomatic to sing. I seem to remember um, I, uh, nobody had any issues with with, with anything like that. Um, the it's important to mention how little time actually we recorded this in. I th we had a three hour rehearsal the night before, and then the entire recording was done in six hours the next day. Um, which is, and I, I seem to remember we finished about an hour early, is that true? I don't think it was an hour, but we did finish <laughs> yeah. it about half an hour early. It yeah. was impressive. I should, have, I should have put in two more tracks. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but but this, is, this is not unusual uh, in terms of recording in the UK, but now um, I, I'm working in Germany now and uh, it's, uh, it's just a totally different world. It's 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 um, the recording experience in 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 England is really, really unique in the in the how quickly you can get things done. I mean, people over here are absolutely amazed that you could have recorded this whole CD in six hours. A couple of my colleagues have had to listen to it already. Um, so it's and the, the 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 choral tradition in the UK really does have an international reputation, and uh, it was great to be a part of that. I would add also the orchestra do the same job. The orchestra are really well trained. They just when the uh, when uh, the light for recording gets on is just extremely quick. Um, so it's not only the choir. I believe that uh, for the fact that uh, the, the the system works in a mixed uh, between private sector and uh, and public uh, with not so much public funding uh, the re this is the main reason why uh, musicians have learned to be very effective because time is money <laughs> it's very simple i think that, that that is the reason behind it um, in germany i know that for instance uh, an orchestra for sure if they had some spare time if um, if uh, the the producer or the conductor decides to add a piece a small piece the orchestra and the unions or whoever would say no something that not necessarily would happen in the uk i would say uh, it could happen but also it's not impossible that an additional piece is recorded if time is available so it's just two different words and approach to to the industry i believe i mean i always i mean and professional musicians whether they're singers or instrumentalists i mean the speed at which they work in this country i mean it's it's a tradition born of necessity because the tradition here is that we have to work very very hard for for very little money and we have to produce the goods very quickly but we do most concerts on one rehearsal um, where in Germany and other places they do it on at least three and um, actually I remember last time I worked in Germany um, um, the singers um, um, we were working or singers I was working with 
and said, God, you, there were a couple of British guys there. And they said, are you still working in, in Britain? Why are you still working there? You have to work so hard. But um, it is amazing how quickly, there is a bad side and a good side to everything, but it is amazing how quickly we are able to get things in the can. Um, and even, I think, in the sh relatively short time that I've been working, I've noticed that it's got quicker, that we can do more ambitious programmes and on rehearsal than we used to be able to do even a few years ago. Mm. Yes. Yes. I remember just, just a, a tiny little aside. I've just remembered now that we had, apart from um, uh, uh, Jacob, we had um, Jacob Ewins singing, who's not here now. So that was the confusing thing for me. We had a Jacob, a Jake, and a Jakes, which is quite an unusual thing, I think. That, you know, just to throw that into the mix. Yes. Yes. I remember that. I remember that. Yeah. Yes. Um, I wondered, um, I mean, it'd be nice to hear from either of the other, um, from the other singers, but um, would it be helpful if I um, say anything about some, one or two of the individual pieces, or um, at this point, or? It would be helpful to, to say something, some things about the, the works, I think, the pieces. So. Uh, yeah, so, well, I'll, I'll try not to go on too long, but um, yeah, I mean, obviously this is the essence of what the disc is about. Um, um, so the first track, Gaudete, I mentioned that um, it was Sasha here who introduced me to that. So that's a medieval setting, but with um, some, hopefully, some unusual harmonies. Um, the Lamb is an interesting one because, well, I'm a huge fan of Blake, and the strange thing is, um, I actually came to setting words very, very late. Um, I wasn't in, it wasn't in my late, I was in my late twenties before I actually completed the setting to words for the first time. When I was at school, I had this problem that I loved poetry, but it seemed to me that if you have a great poem um, and you set it to music, the poem already has the music in, 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 inside it because of the sounds, a great poet uses the sounds that the language makes. So if you add that extra element that isn't intended to music, then that element that the poets put in is lost. Um, and it was really um, Shakespeare and Blake that showed me the way. So Blow, Blow Thou Winter Wine, which is track seven on this disc, is actually the first piece I ever wrote for choir, and the first piece, first time I ever set um, words to music. Um, and the reason I found it so difficult, I, I found the way here, is because Shakespeare, um, when he writes um, a set of words um, that's meant to be set to music, it has a completely different quality, it seems to me, than his other words. And it invites the composer to add that extra element. It's really weird. And um, once I realized that, um, I think that um, things like, um, Blow, Blow, Thou Winter Wind, and particularly Full Fathom Five and some of the other Shakespeare songs in the plays, they're almost hard to set them badly. Um, some texts, um, you know, it's hard to think of a bad setting. Um, so that was the story behind that. Um, of course, like once I started, then, then I sort of couldn't stop. But um, that's the story really behind O Manion Mysterium, because I always thought, well, I wouldn't set that because there are so many great settings. That's a classic example. Such amazingly beautiful words. There are so many great settings that it's almost hard to set it badly. I thought, well, I wouldn't set that. But then I thought, oh, well, if I did do it, what would I do? And then before you know it, I'd done it. And that was my first setting for double choir. That's for double choir throughout. Um, then um, the lamb is an interesting one because that's Blake is the other one who like Shakespeare, there's, there's people, poets who are as good for setting to music as, there might be poets who are as good at setting to music as Blake and Shakespeare, but nobody better. They are the ones who really understand music. Um, they must have had a really strong musical instinct. Blake actually um, set the, his own songs to music that he made up himself, but we don't have them because he didn't write them down, he just sang them. But um, the Lamb is interesting because it's such a beautiful poem. Again, it's been set very well in the past. But um, the, what I thought, what it inspired me to do was to think of a simple structure that mirrored the beautifully simple structure of the text. The first verse being a question, 
and the second verse being an answer. So the first verse is mostly ascending with the soprano, mostly with the sopranos and altos, with the women voices, and the second verse is mostly descending with the men verses, with the with the male voices. Um, and the other thing um, is that I thought I would use just white notes for that, which is what I've done in one other piece before. Um, I think Marie was here, Marie Vassiliou. I wrote a piece for her for soprano and 20 strings called um, Love Journeys. And the penultimate movement of that is very, very dissonant and any climaxes on a big 12 note chord. So the final movement is completely the opposite. It's all on white notes. And you'd think using white notes, you'd be very limited. But it turns out, I think, I hope this piece, then let the, the lamb demonstrates that, that the, um, the harmonies that you can use just using white notes are surprisingly rich and wonderful and varied. And the other thing, why in white notes? The weird thing about white notes, as anyone who is familiar with Sibelius's Sixth Symphony, for example, will know, is that somehow white notes conjure up whiteness. Um, so um, Sibelius' Sixth Symphony tends to conjure up a very snowy landscape. And so the idea behind the white notes used in the land is to conjure up the whiteness of the land, of the, of the fleece, which of course is referred to in the poem. So um, that's a bit about some of the pieces. One other what I should mention um, is the 12 Days of Christmas, which um, that's been done by quite a few choirs. And every choir that does it, even though it is monstrously challenging, they all seem to <laughs> enjoy it. Um, um, but that's, um, so for those of you who haven't heard it, it's the same, um, it's one song to the tune of another, same words, um, different music, um, but kind of, um, Quite crazy. I mean, I'm a gr um, there's that thing that Bert Whistle said: to be any good as a composer, you need to be prepared to go to extremes. Um, I think, in its own way, that piece sort of the sort of that setting of the Twelve Days of Christmas sort of does that. Um, just a quick word um, about the last two: the anthem for doomed youth and Flanders Fields, which sort of breaks the rule because anthem for doomed youth is a great poem, which is not intended to be set to music, but um, I, I was commissioned to write a piece for Remembrance Day and I thought, well, um, there are lots of settings of it, but I thought, again, it's a poem I thought I wouldn't do, but I thought, let's see what happens if I do it. Um, but the interesting one is in Flanders Fields, which was um, uh, Jill, um, a lovely lady called Jill Ford, who sang in actually um, both, um, in two choirs that I conducted, Lloyd's Choir and Reading Festival Chorus. I see that Bill Ellison is here, who's from Reading Festival Chorus. Um, she, um, when, um, she said to me, why don't you do a remembrance? Every year, um, Lloyd's Choir do a remembrance, um, have to do a remembrance service. And she said, why don't you do a piece for, for this? And I said, I would, but I've never found the right text. So she gave me her um, anthology of, of poems, which I still have to this day. And I said, well, I'll, I'll, I'll look through. Uh, very shortly after that, she became um, very ill. Um, she became terminally ill and she passed away very quickly. Um, so I thought, well, I have to do it now. And so that's dedicated to her. And as it's a, a soprano, um, it's for soprano, solo soprano and choir. I can't remember which one of you, Jeremy, you'll remember which one, who did the soprano for that? I don't know if you remember. <laughs> I'm, ju I'm just trying to remember. I'm looking at all sorts of um, material here and I can't, I can't just can't you, remember. You Flanders, Flanders Fields, yeah? Yeah. Was that you? I, one of, no, 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 no. That one wasn't me. I think it was one of the Ashby's. Um, right. <laughs> so Kate or Helen, one of the twins. Identical twins, so, you know. Uh, <laughs> It, that that sounds right, actually. Yeah, I yes. I mean, I'm just looking at the scores, and I'm trying to remember, but I can't. So yeah, one of the Ashby's. Yeah. So anyway, that's a bit about. So Evo, I'll I'll hand back to you, and maybe if anyone else has any questions, I'm just because yeah, I'm just sort of looking at the stuff now as you're going through it. Because I think generally when we were deciding, you you showed me all the music and. Um, and I did work through um, a lot of it quite carefully, but interestingly, and I've, it, this is all coming back to me now, 
I didn't um, work through the 12 days of, I didn't give the 12 days of Christmas um, what I should, because, do you know what I mean? You turn up the first page and it's the rhythms that you'd expect. And it, do you know what I mean? It, it sort of seems to be going your way. And so I don't think I fully judged at the time what was going to happen over the page. Because you know, it does, it goes, on the first day of his attitude, I've said to me, you know, and you think, oh, well, we know what, what's going to happen here. But of course, what actually then just gets more and more complicated. The rhythm gets stupid. It's totally out of control, utterly manic. And it was at that point that I remember thinking, yeah, do your homework. It's because it's the thing that you, you always learn as a conductor, you know, don't you? As a young conductor, you know, there, there's one thing that's going to catch you out. And, you know, and it's nothing to do, you know, I mean, it might be your ear, but it, do your homework. And, and I sat there thinking, oh, God, I just looked at it, oh, oh, God, oh, here we go. During the rehearsal, I was thinking, yeah, I wasn't prepared for this, just wasn't prepared. <laughs> that's, that's really, I'm really pleased to hear you say that because I've always thought it would be, and I've often mentioned this to my um, students, my composition students, that I've always wanted to see a film um, where, and often I talk about film when I'm talking about music because it's a really good uh, way of when people don't understand, when you're trying to explain something to do with music, I use film as an analogy because film is another art form where time, the way you structure, the way you use time is so critical. Um, and I've always wanted to see a film, actually there, I, I did see one recently which sort of did that, a film where it starts off um, and you've got no idea where it's going. So it might start off like a gentle situation comedy. And then something goes a bit weird. And eventually it turns like a full on sci-fi fantasy flick. Um, there's a film Cloverfield. I don't want to say any more about it, which is sort of a bit like that. But I've always wanted to write a piece. There's an orchestral piece of mine that sort of does that. And it, um, which is where it starts with a simple lullaby. Oh, right, we know what's happening here. And then it goes more and more crazy. And it, yeah, well, there's a piece by Schnitka that also does that um, um, kind of um, So I've always sort of wanted to write a piece like that. And I think from what you're saying, 12 Days of Christmas sort of does that to an extent. <laughs> so I'm very gratified by that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I lent our copy to um, Greg Hallam, our, uh, RFC's current uh, musical director, about 18 months ago, trying to persuade him to do it with us, and I haven't seen it back again. <laughs> Very wise. <laughs> yeah, it's not. It's such fun. Off. Terrific. <laughs> Incidentally, I should apologise for not being Carrie, Jakes, but she's unwell at the moment, so I've oh, well, her ticket, as it was. I will send her my best wishes for a very quick recovery. Thank you. Yeah. Can I just chip, chip in about the 12 days as well? Because I think it does start off and it appears like it's going to be straightforward, and then you realise soon that you're getting into sort of some quite outrageous territory. Um, but at the end of it, there is a massive sense of of triumph over ad adversity, um, which I think is a, is a kind of key feature in your music. Um, and so whilst it might seem like a kind of novelty item, actually I think there's a lot more to that piece, which I hope will, well, I, I believe comes over really strongly. That's just my little contribution. Thank you. Thank you. I, 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 I <laughs> When I when I've heard it sung well, and particularly like it is on this recording, there is something quite, I hope, quite uplifting in a quite new, powerful way, um, which I wasn't aware of when I wrote it. It might be just entirely due to the way it was sung, but I did feel, I did sort of feel the tears pricking a bit at that point. And, you know, to move, it's funny because um, actually just this week, two days ago, I got an email out of the blue from a PhD student who's writing a PhD about com composers and why we write and all this sort of thing. And he said, so I said, oh, I serve, I'm not sure. He said, there's just one question. It's what good has your music, what good has your music done? And I said, well, one question, but what a question. And I said, actually, initially I thought, well, I'll need to go away and think about that and probably write a long essay. And then I just thought about it off the top of my head. I spent just two minutes on it and I just wrote back and I said, well, I said, this is a really difficult question, but I think off the top of my head, I would say, 
I hope that the good that my music has done is a hope that it is as good as it can be on its own terms and that it has moved some people. And he wrote back and he said, that's great. And actually that's a really original response, which surprised me because actually I thought that was obvious. What else does any composer want to do? But actually having looked at it, I think that is what I'm trying to achieve. Well, probably, well, I think what we're all trying to achieve, but I can't, I can't speak for other composers, but you know, you can't move everyone, but I hope it moves some people. And and it's 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 as good as it can be, on its own terms. I mean, um, I see that Tom, uh, Tom was here a minute ago. I think he's just this second disappeared. Um, Tom Armstrong. I'd be interested to know if he agrees with that as a composer. But uh, but there we are. Hi, Jakes. Oh, hi. Uh, yes. Yeah. What, you don't have to comment on what I just said, but um, uh, uh, well, uh, yeah. Funnily enough, I was thinking that I'm not sure my music does <laughs> move people um, or that I think it's very important personally. I mean, I, I, I know your music quite well. I can see that it's full of really kind of deep feeling and, and it's, it's very emotional in, in a good way. Um, I, mine is a bit cooler and that's to some people's taste, but certainly not to everybody's. So, uh, you know, there we go. Yeah, but you might find, I mean, it's interesting because there's two aspects to that. What you feel your music is saying and what it says to other people. I mean, Stravinsky always came up with all this stuff about my music's objective, it's not emotional. But I think it really, well, emotional is a funny word, but it does move people. And I don't know if that's what he wanted or it isn't, but it does. And, and I mean, it's an interesting, it opens a big, we could easily talk about this for, for several hours. But um, that thing, the thing with Boulez, who seemed always in denial that music couldn't ever communicate any kind of emotional message. And what I always imagined myself saying to him <laughs> in a hypothetical um, discussion, because we never met, would be, well, people, if people, people feel, people think it's moving, therefore it is. It might be an illusion. What's real, what's not, I don't know. So you might be, Tom, you might be, um, selling yourself short but then uh, then again it doesn't matter if it achieves what you want to achieve it doesn't i find i found sea drift very beautiful um actually so i don't know if that was the response you were hoping for but this a piece of tom's which i conducted uh, a few years ago yes anyway <laughs> what it's worth we'll see yeah <laughs> So um, I'll hand back to Evo, and um, if any of you have uh, any questions, I'm very happy to answer. But I think um, I think we've made covered the main points at least generally. We did, but of course uh, uh, we are open to any sorts of question in relation to the recording, your work, your future plans. Um, not just for this recording, but in general as well. It would be interesting to know what would be happening after all this mess is sorted out <laughs> worldwide, because obviously uh, the, uh, the present, a lot of things are not happening because of the, of the present situation, but it would be interesting to know what are your future plans and ideas as well. Well, in terms of recording, um, we're in discussion um, to record um, uh, my um, uh, chamber opera, The Lady of Satis House, with Marie, who is here. Um, hopefully, um, uh, yes, and we're, um, we're planning to record that with the um, Piatti String Quartet, and also um, with a piece that I um, wrote for them, uh, which they commissioned me to write, called From Behind the Lungs. So. The opera for um, the opera is for um, soprano and string quartet. And um, if you're interested, you can see a performance that we did a few years ago online. Um, um, if you go to my website, um, and so it, it, the Lady of Satis House. It's about Miss Havisham from Great Expectations, and um, also a piece called From Behind Glass, which um, they commissioned me to write, which is about a quartet of Stradivarius instruments in the um, in the, the real the royal palace in Madrid, um, and in the it describes a scenario in which they uh, break they they try to play together and they're in different 
times and different keys, but eventually they break the glass at the climax and they play a tune, they play together, um, and the melody that they eventually emerge is that they're trying to play is the Song of the Birds, which um, used to be played by Pablo Casals, who was a great cellist and was a symbol of freedom. Anyway, and another piece which I was commissioned to write for the Fitzwilliam String Quartet. So that's another thing we're planning to write. I've been, one thing about the lockdown, I haven't been doing much conducting, but um, I have been doing a lot of composing. I've been working on a very big um, programmatic um, orchestral piece, um, which I've been in some discussions with one of the major orchestras in London about recording it. Um, but um, it's early days, we'll see. And um, I have plans for another, another orchestral piece after that. And, and to finish off the opera that I wrote many, that I started writing many years ago. So, um, and then obviously, hopefully, um, in the few months, we'll get back to our normal performing work, like it, well, all of us will, as we hope. So that's really future plans. Yes, yes, as far as they go at the moment, without, without going into too much detail and going on too long. Yes. Okay. Um, if, uh, of course, if there are more questions, we are, you know, we are here. So the, now is the time to speak uh, for everyone who wants to ask things about uh, the um, the recording as well. Uh, maybe uh, I can introduce you to uh, Mark, who is at uh, the 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 director of uh, Willow Hain, who is also the aggregator for several markets uh, we work with. So, Mark, would you like to say something? Uh, are, you, are you there? Uh, yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, so, as well as having our own record label, um, we distribute a number of labels worldwide, uh, both physically and digitally. Um, including uh, ICSM. Uh, so uh, this this new release um, uh, has today been uh, put on our website to because uh, obviously uh, we'd like to capture uh, not only just get the CD out there and known to people, but capture the uh, Christmas market that, that's coming up as well. Okay. okay. Um, well, I'm I'm very happy to work with you. I've, I've known you for a few years. Uh, even if at present the the industry is not exactly in the greatest shape possible because of uh, streaming, which personally I'm mm. not a great fan. Not because of the streaming itself, but because of uh, the way that basically. Um, payments are distributed because obviously um, if uh, now musicians are not welcome at the Spotify offices in, in New York any longer because if you see their lavish uh, style, lifestyle, you would ask yourself where the, are the money going and it, it is clearly into the payouts of their uh, the people because the if people are obviously forgetting the fact that the people who created Spotify the same the same who were considered before that pirates uh, with Napster and so on so they just got some better lawyers and uh, they legalized piracy because that's what 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 it is. Of course, it's very convenient for all of us to use Spotify, which I don't personally out of uh, out of principle. <laughs> I don't use their platform because I don't like what they do. Um, and I don't believe it's a, an evil necessity. I believe it's simply uh, something that hasn't been regulated properly because uh, uh, for any sort of uh, thing that is considered commercially, it should generate revenue in order to generate new content. That is a fact. And the way it is being paid, we had, uh, funnily enough, three recordings of ICSM for some reason ended up in, a, in, a, in some playlists. And they ge generated 1.5 million 
Pistons, the three of them. The one was Stravinsky, um, uh, Four Hands with My Wife. The other one was Dennis Lee, the first recording of DBC. And the other one was Brahms' uh, Cello and Piano Sonatas. These three recordings um, generated 1.5 million uh, listens and, uh, and at the same time generated $3,000 <laughs> revenue which is clearly uh, well be below the cost of producing a new, one new recording. So this is a bit of a paradox because obviously for classical music, this kind of uh, numbers are, are huge, but at the same time, uh, it's just plain wrong in terms of uh, revenue. So um, I personally still believe that we should keep working in the physical and the digital uh, distribution and of course in some cases release some things on on the streaming platforms but we should still inform people how things are uh, because that's not uh, the future I believe for new content um, I, I can I can add to that to say that certainly um, with the the figures that, that, that I've seen and I get figures each week. Um, in the UK, um, although CD sales took a tumble uh, at the beginning of lockdown, um, they have recovered and certainly um, CD sales uh, in some European countries have, have been very good and I think um, there are still lots of people that, as you say, really appreciate having a physical product, um, you know, to actually a tangible product rather than something that they can just stream. Yes. Um, so I think certainly in a lot of countries, there's the CD format has still got a pretty long life ahead. Like Japan, for instance. Japan is a very strong market for physical. Yes. Yeah. The, yes, pride of ownership, I believe, is the reason for yeah. the Japanese well, uh, we, music bloggers. We're doing what we can to redress that balance. And certainly, I think products like this, in terms of the way it's presented, really, really help. To that end, actually, I see we have a question from um, May. May Haydon, wonderful singer I've, I've worked with, um, I've been lucky enough to work with a lot, who asks, would you mind saying again where we can buy the recording, Ivo? Uh, of course, uh, the the very first will be available uh, through Willow Haynes' uh, website, uh, which will be shortly followed uh, from our website. And of course, there will be some uh, physical distribution uh, in several on several markets. Uh, I think uh, we have a presence in about thirty countries overall between uh, between uh, of course Naxos distribution uh, and also some individual markets which we manage individually like uh, uh, Italy, Japan, uh, Bulgaria, uh, Slovakia which we work direct so um, it would be available of course on Amazon as well I believe uh, that is uh, the, the usual suspect platform. And I don't know how many shops are left, to be honest with you, anymore, because uh, there used to be, uh, I don't know, more than 10 shops two, three years ago in the UK, and maybe there are less because Bath has closed. Um, the one on uh, Great Marlborough uh, in London is closed now. So uh, I think in London, there is only foils available as a shop. So I believe uh, um, online sales are the things that are working at the moment. But the first stop is Willow Hain, of course, uh, because they already put it on, 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 the, uh, on their website, which we haven't yet. <laughs> and uh, uh, their stock will be with them, I think, on Monday. So oh, fantastic. Yes. Would you mind just would you mind just spelling it or putting it in the chat just in case, um, Evo? But um, while you're doing uh, that, 
in order to avoid any uh, misspelling, I would ask Mark to do the, that okay. with, the, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the link of just, the website. Uh, I'll just see if I can find where the chat is. I'm sure Claire will come in on this. She'll know. Oh, I found it. Yeah. So while, while Mark's doing that, um, so um, yeah, basically from, from, from the Willow Hing website initially, then ICSM, but hopefully before too long, you should be able to just sort of, um, if you type in eventually. Yes, um, it should be know, available on Amazon and all that. Yes. If you Here Google you. Cohen's cows eventually, but initially, um, exactly. Thank you, Mark. That's great. Okay. And um, one thing, um, of course, I've already told the performers that I will give them um, my CDs each because I you don't know, think it's right that, you know, and Jeremy and Dave, that, you know, you just um, let me have your address and Jake and so on has already, Jake's already written me. I'll make sure you get one eventually um, when I get, I get round to it. Hopefully um, um, it, it won't take me too long. But actually all of you, um, I think, I hope you don't mind Evo, but I'm very happy to make sure that everyone here gets we a CD. Can, we can send them, if, uh, if they want to uh, put their address, we can send them along to the press because obviously uh we will uh, we will start sending now to the press the recording uh for for reviews there is for sure one or two people who show already some interest so hopefully uh the recording will be reviewed it's not very easy as everyone knows because there are uh worldwide i think something in the region of uh a uh, few hundred cds released every month so it's a tough choice uh, to to choose what what to review, but let's remain hopeful and uh, and see what we can do because the, the recording it's it's really worth it. Yeah, so I'm very happy for all of you. Obviously, more than happy for you to have a CD. So I hope you enjoy listening to it. And um, well, if you like it, please just spread the word. <laughs> that will help, obviously. But I hope very much that you enjoy listening to it. Um, I'm very proud of what we've done here. Um, so um, um, I hope you, you, in, you all enjoy listening to it. Okay. Um, Good luck with for, it. Thank you for everyone, uh, to, to everyone for attending this event. I hope it was interesting. And, uh, and um, well, keep in touch, not only with Jake, with us as well uh to see what we do uh we would be very happy to let you have news of other things that we are publishing and uh, um and uh well have a lovely december everyone i hope it's not too boring the way you're <laughs> passing time but uh i'm sure uh will be allowed at least to meet one person over the next 30 days or something <laughs> let's hope that things are slightly you know more a bit we will try somehow to uh you know to make the best of it thank you thank, very you. Much. thank you to everyone thank you thank you bye 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 bye, bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.